With each passing day, a little bit more truth is being revealed. And I'm having to wonder how long is it going to be before many people for the first time see the truth of all that has gone on these past years. This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. And I want to welcome you to the weekend edition of Truth to Ponder. And I'm your host, Bob Bierman. I want to spend a few minutes at the beginning of this program just reminding you of something most of you already know, how much we've been lied to over the past two years. But the lies are not only two years old, they're three years old, four years old, eight, ten. We've been lied to for for quite a long time here in the United States and Canada and Europe and the United Kingdom and Australia professional liars in the elite political class have said things that I really believe they knew were not true when they said them to begin with. With each passing day, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time just to give you a few examples about COVID-19. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time, but I just want to kind of tie it together for a minute or two here and, and kind of review much of what has been said since the beginning of the pandemic in the early part of 2020. And my question today is one that many people are beginning to have. What did individuals know and when did they know it and why did they deceive us consistently? And I'm talking about those that created this virus, yeah, the virus was lab created. We were told back in 2020, you can't say that. YouTube would kick you off. Twitter would shut you down. Facebook would call it misinformation to even suggest that this virus came from some laboratory, maybe maybe Wuhan. Some even think maybe even Ukraine maybe even here in the United States, that this was a gain-of-function bioweapon. You couldn't say that. But see, truth has a tendency to, to wear down the lie. It may take some time. It's like a rock at a seashore. As the water keeps hitting it and hitting it, over time, the rock erodes. And these lies will consistently be be beaten up by the truth, and eventually, the truth is revealed. The question I have today is, will any of those that perpetuated lies about the pandemic to seize power and control and reset economies, change elections, and in some cases, I really believe to, what's the best way to put this? I think people like Governor Cuomo in New York, uh, Prickster in Illinois, Murphy in in New Jersey, Gavin Newsom in California, among many others. They really, they really were stroking their ego with this newfound power, and it became almost an addiction and a sickness to shut you down and to make rules for you that you had to live by, though they never lived by them themselves. They enjoyed putting you into fear. And I really believe that many people in high levels of government at the state level, at the federal level, and even internationally, they knew a lot more about this virus than they were letting on. Now, I'm just going to say this, that Back in 2020, I came out of retirement and I worked for an emergency management agency. My job was a public information officer for a fairly good-sized county in a different state. And it didn't take me long to realize much of what I was being asked to tell you or tell the population in which I was serving was not necessarily true. Something didn't ring right. And the research I was doing was yielding information to me that was contradicting much of what the establishment, like Dr. Fauci and and those at the CDC and those at the FDA, NIH, uh, World Health Organization, what they were saying. And I would 
watch Fauci and Burks do their little, you know, freak show on television. They called it a press conference. And I could detect in my spirit, the only way to put it, that the man was lying. There was something wrong. There was something that just didn't feel right. And I resigned my position and left. I could have stayed there and enjoyed the money for many, many months to come. But I knew that I was doing something wrong. But I learned a lot during that time I may never have learned had I not done that job. And we were told many, many things. Hospitals, we've talked about this. I'm not going to get into it much now. Just to say hospital protocols, I believe, and many doctors believe, who have put their medical license and practice on the line, believe the protocols given by the CDC ensured a mass number of people dying. It's plain and simple. If we treated the flu the way we treated COVID, we would have vastly more people dying of the flu. It's it's that simple. And these governments and all their efforts have instilled such unbelievable levels of fear in people. And many will never recover from this. They'll be psychologically scarred for the remainder of their life. Just the other day, my wife and I had to stop at a little grocery store not far from our home. And I watched this man, probably younger than I am. I turned 68 Sunday, the 16th. And I'm watching this guy coming out of a grocery store, probably, I would say, 45 to 50 at the the tops. And he's pushing his little grocery cart, and he's wearing this large black face mask, outdoors. And I kind of watched him as I'm walking toward the grocery store. I slowed down and he went to his truck. He had a big pickup truck and he put his grocery bags in and then he pushed the cart off to the side and he got into his vehicle and drove away wearing the face mask. He lives in fear. And no matter how many times we're now learning that the the face mask is a worthless gesture that has no basis in science, people are still believing, well, maybe it might work for me. Maybe I won't get the virus. And even, even when they were pushing the face mask back in, you know, March and April of 2020, the whole idea was every grocery store had this announcement My mask protects you, and your mask protects me. In other words, you're doing it to protect you, making you protect other people, to give you a guilt trip. It's not that you're helping yourself. We know it doesn't do that. But it might stop, as Fauci once said, a dropper or two, and that even proved to be phony baloney. And then we were told by Fauci, during that uh, year 2020 when Operation Warp Speed started, maybe with some of the best intents, and I think there was a lot of evil behind it that was unrevealed at the time. We could never have a vaccine within years. It's going to take years to get it. You know, maybe four or five. You got to study this stuff. You got to do testing. You got to have trials. And we'll never get through that before the end of this year. It's not going to happen. And then a week after the election, oh, we have a vaccine. And everybody's got to start taking it. And we've learned a lot since then of how much we have been lied to. The television and YouTube and radio and videos were full of people like this nurse uh, in Ohio that had this to say about the vaccine when it came out and what it would do. Vaccination is so important. I am vaccinated. My parents are vaccinated. My entire family is vaccinated. All of my colleagues in the Division of Infectious Diseases are vaccinated. And when my 14-month-old son is old enough, he will be vaccinated. By all of us getting vaccinated, it stops the virus from having places to go and infect other people. That's how we're going to get out of this pandemic. So please, get vaccinated as soon as you can. So just to remind you here so there's no misunderstanding, what you heard was from about a year ago. And these are people in the medical profession making the claim that we can stop the virus, we can stop the spread if you get vaccinated because you become the end of the line if COVID should come your way. 
Matter of fact, that was echoed even by the President of the United States. And here's something that he said on October the 14th of 2021. Third point I'd like to make. We need to continue to keep our schools and our students safe. 96% of school districts are fully open with children back in the classroom and for in-person learning. We have been able to do this because we provided our schools the resources they need to protect children and the educators, as well as the staff that works in the schools. We've been encouraging schools to implement important health measures like masking, testing, and getting everyone vaccinated who is eligible to be vaccinated. So let's go back a year ago when Joe Biden made that particular statement, October the 14th of 2021, that we needed to keep masking going because, see, it stops the spread. We need everybody to get vaccinated because if you get vaccinated, and Joe Biden said this many, many times, that you won't get covid And if you don't get COVID, you can't spread COVID. That's what the president of the United States said. Now, I'm not saying the president is a doctor and should be treated as such. But you would think somewhere on his staff, people that do have a medical background, people like Dr. Fauci, who he put a tremendous amount of respect, and his surgeon general, who, by the way, made lots of money from pharmaceutical corporations before coming back into government service as the uh, Surgeon General. All of them had Joe Biden make these statements, yet they didn't have one shred of evidence to back it up. And Joe Biden continued on a year ago making this statement. My team and I are doing everything we can But I'm calling on more businesses to step up. I'm calling on more parents to get their children vaccinated when they are eligible. And I'm asking everyone, everyone who hasn't gotten vaccinated, please get vaccinated. That's how we put this pandemic behind us and accelerate our economic recovery. We can do this. Okay, President Biden, let's uh, clear up the, the facts here. Number one, there is no economic recovery your recently signed Inflation Reduction Act will do nothing for inflation. You're breaking records on inflation. I haven't seen inflation like this any time in my life, ever. And I turned 68 this weekend. So no, no, Mr. Biden, you're dead wrong. Your administration has done nothing for the economy and you've done nothing in terms of COVID-19. You've used it, you've abused it, you've taken advantage of it, you've been power hungry with it, you've used it for a global reset. You want to reset the economy and and you want to use the same kind of lockdowns we did for COVID for climate change. No, your, your entire administration is evil and deceptive and you lie a lot. Matter of fact, most times when you are in front of an audience or you're press secretary is speaking to the press corps it is mostly untrue it is mostly lying and that is very disturbing that we have been lied to for so many years and the lies get deeper and deeper longer and longer stronger and stronger and sadly too many people buy in even up in canada Justin Trudeau is still hanging on to the vaccine lie. This is what he said just a matter of a few weeks ago. Oh, Canada, our home and native land. COVID's not done with us yet. We might want to be done with it, but it's still around. And yes, we have a lot more tools, a lot more understanding, a lot more knowledge on how to keep ourselves and our loved ones safe that have allowed us to get back to regular life in a lot of ways for a whole bunch of people. But we also know that as winter comes and as people get pushed back indoors, there is a real risk of another serious wave of COVID. One of the best things we can do to prevent that way, prevent the pressure on our healthcare system, prevent provinces from having to take decisions around restrictions and mandates, is to ensure that everyone 
is up to date in their vaccinations. Now, so we don't forget, so we do not forget, we were told we had to be vaccinated. Joe Biden here in the United States was demanding companies of over 100 people force their employees to get vaccinated or fire them. Airlines fired pilots. School teachers were laid off. Firefighters, people in the first line of COVID were fired because they refused to take this experimental vaccine. And the reason they were fired, they were told, because this will stop the spread. And people were treated like they were treated in Nazi Germany in many parts of the world with things like vaccine passports. You couldn't go certain places, do certain things, participate in society unless you had the passport. Even New York State, the Excelsior passport, you must be vaccinated. And for what? We ended up being a totalitarian world because of this vaccine. May I see your papers? I don't think I have them on me. In that case, we'll have to ask you to come along. Wait, it's possible that I... Yes. Here we are. These papers expired three weeks ago. You have to come along. Halt! Halt! And since these vaccines rolled out at the end of 2020 and started getting mandated around the world beginning in the spring, summer, and fall of 2021. And why? Why did governments do this? Did they really believe that these vaccines would stop you from getting or spreading COVID? And the more that I have looked into this, the more that I have been reading, just following this story as close as I have now, Since the very beginning, since before the election of 2020, since literally the summer of 2020, when this program began, before there was even a vaccine, we were calling out the bad usage of COVID to steal an election. And you can't say that anymore. And then we've seen these vaccine mandates being used and abused by power hungry people determined to reset the world in their own image and take your freedom away in the process. Earlier this week, there was an exchange at the EU in Europe and a member of the EU parliament was questioning one of the executives from Pfizer and presented this question. When did you do the studies to find out how this would stop the spread? And I want you to listen very carefully to this very short and very pertinent exchange between this member of parliament and this executive from Pfizer. U, mevrouw Small, heb ik de volgende vraag waar ik een duidelijk antwoord op wil. And I will speak in English so there are no misunderstandings. Was the Pfizer COVID vaccine tested on stopping the transmission of the virus before it entered the market? If not, please say it clearly. If yes, are you willing to share the data with this committee? And I really want a straight answer, yes or no, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Um, Regarding the question around, um, did we know about stopping humanization before um, it's entered the market? No. Uh, These, um, you know, we had to really move at the speed of science to really understand what is taking place in the market. It was all a lie. Every bit of it, everything you were told by your presidents, by your premiers, by your medical establishment, by the WHO, by the FDA, by the NIH, by the CDC, by the World Health Organization, by the World Economic Forum, it was all a big lie. Every bit of it. And they knew it. Pfizer knew it was a lie. They knew they had no proof that this even worked. And they never did a long-term study on the negative effects. And now they work diligently to cover up any vaccine injuries, any premature deaths, any bad side effects, any delineation of your immune system. We can't talk about any of that. 
My concern now is will anybody ever be held responsible for lying to the world about these vaccines and about what they did? Will they be held accountable? My prayer is they will. Listen, we got a break coming up. We're running a little over. And I have some good stuff to share on the other side. If you believe in our ministry, would you consider giving it your financial support? Our mailing address, by the way, make the check payable to Ancient Word Radio. That's Ancient Word Radio. Our mailing address is Post Office Box 510, P.O. Box 510. The city is Chilhowie, C-H-I-L-H-O-W-I-E, Chilhowie, Virginia. The zip code in Chilhowie is 24319. That's 24319. And we will be right back. This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. The coming joy. Coming up. Shalom Aleichem. This is Jonathan Kahn, your Jewish connection, bringing you the riches of your Jewish roots in Jesus. Now get your pen out as fast as you can so you don't miss out on receiving a special free gift you're going to get and love in a moment. The Feast of Tabernacles, Chag Sukkot, it was the final feast of the Hebrew year. It was the end of the sacred year. It was the closing, the ingathering. So there's a prophetic mystery about it. You see, God has set up this age as a Hebrew year. The Hebrew year ends with trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets, then Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement and and Meeting God, the Day of Judgment, and then Feast of Tabernacles, the, the celebration of rejoicing. And if you look at the end of the age, or at the end of the Bible even, you'll see these same things in that order. You'll see first trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets, trumpets, and the rapture, and all those things, the trumpets of the Lord. Then you'll find the Day of the Lord, meeting God, and redemption, and judgment. And then you find the rejoicing, the the kingdom, God tabernacling with us. If even you look at the end of the Old Testament, near the end, Zechariah, and at the end of Zechariah, Zechariah 14, you says, it says that in the kingdom, we will celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. God will be there. And then at the end of the Bible itself, uh, right near the end, Revelation 22, it says, then God will dwell among us. He will tabernacle among us. You see, tabernacles was the feast of joy. For God's people, joy comes at the end. Here's the, here's the, the ultimate thing. And that is that everything we do in God, it will end towards joy. It may be hard at first, but do it God's way because joy comes at the end. Be encouraged. Be encouraged because the best is yet to come. You just keep following God because for you, God has saved the best for last and joy cometh at the end. Happy Tabernacles. Now, the free gift for you. The most incredible, awesome mystery of the temple doors free. It's your gift and sapphires guaranteed to give you the power of living a victorious life in God. How do you get these gifts free? Well, easy. Just remember Jesus' real Hebrew name, Yeshua, and you dial it. That's it. Just dial 1-800-YESHUA-1. That's 1-800. You will be blessed, but call now. 1-800-YESHUA-1. Now, my friend, you're on this earth for a great purpose, to be a blessing. I invite you to join me to bring the greatest blessing to the unreached peoples of the world, salvation to five continents. You can actually beam the word of life by shortwave radio around the earth. We do it every week. It's incredible. You can be part. Just call 1-800-YESHUA-1. That's Y-E-S-H-U-A-1. Or you can write me direct. Here's how. It's right to the Nice Jewish Boy, Box 1111, Lodi, L-O-D-I, New Jersey, 07644. Nice Jewish Boy, 1111, Lodi, New Jersey, 07644. Till next time, this is Jonathan Kahn saying, Rejoice, my friend. The best is yet to come in Messiah, Adon Olam, the Lord of the Universe. This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. And I want to welcome you back to part two of our weekend edition of Truth to Ponder. I'm your host, Bob Bierman. We talked at the beginning of this program today and in the first section about how our governments worldwide have been dishonest with us. And there's no doubt there is a group of elite people behind so much of the turmoil in this world today. Let's be honest, there are people that make a lot of money off turmoil and war and pharmaceuticals and you name it. It's all about the money far too often. And none of this is really very new. I want to take you back in just a moment 
to six years ago, roughly this weekend, back in 2016. It was prior to the 2016 election. My wife and I were living and working in Florida, and I was also assisting a church in our community. And about every week or two, I would have the opportunity of speaking and and delivering God's word and preaching to that congregation. And the idea of deception, manipulation is as old as the world itself. And I wanted to point that out to the congregation at that time to be to be very cautious about everything you read, you see, you hear. This idea just because there's someone you like and you saw it on the internet doesn't necessarily mean it's true. We need to prove all things. We need to study deeply into God's word. And we need to be, let's say, open-eyed to see the truth that is around us. And so I want to take you back six years ago. I think I was getting ready to turn 62 at that time, not 68, as I shared this message about honesty, integrity, and to be not deceived to this congregation at this church. And maybe this message will mean something even for you today. You'll see there's nothing new under the sun. So let's go back six years ago this weekend. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Can you believe that we've had this nice break in the weather? Yes. This is what Florida is really all about. This is why we're here. We're not here for June, July, August, and September. We are here from mid-October to what, May? And then it, after there we have to endure the summer. But I will admit one thing. I lived in Georgia for a number of years and also part of South Carolina, and it gets hotter in the summer there than it does here. Trust me on that. How often do we see temperatures over 100 here? I did in South Carolina all the time. And and the humidity also at 100% at the same time. So I can't complain too much about our summertime, though I can understand why people would rather be in Minnesota or Maine or Michigan or the Upper Peninsula, I get it. And uh, now I'm beginning to notice as we see more people in the stores and the restaurants, you know, that a lot of our, our friends are coming back here to the state of Florida. When I look at the lessons for today, there are several different themes that are running around between the Psalm, the Old Testament lesson, the epistle, and even the gospel. There are several little messages, but I'd like to take a moment to tie them all together, if I could. There is kind of a theme that runs through this. And the one line that stands out from the Old Testament lesson is actually the last verse of that lesson. And this is the prophet Jeremiah speaking as he says on God's behalf, For my people are foolish, they know me not, they are stupid children, they have no understanding, they are wise in doing evil, but how to do good, they know not. As I heard that again this morning, I read it earlier this week, and to hear the words being said, It really hits me about the human condition that we see in the world today, especially in the Western world. Those of us who are supposed to be better educated, better scientifically adjusted to the world, better in understanding our history and all the things we're supposed to have with the lifestyle we live And then God to say these words through the prophet Jeremiah. My people are foolish. They know me not. They are stupid children. They have no understanding. They are wise in doing evil. 
but how to do good they know not. Any one of us sitting here could probably think of a half a dozen examples within our own society today, whether it's in the news, whether it's in politics, whether it's in Hollywood, whether it's in entertainment, that fits the bill of that verse beautifully. My children are stupid. They don't even understand the difference between good and evil. Evil, they do right, they do great. How do I put this? Look at the movies that are put out by Hollywood. It is almost a rush to the gutter in terms of the language that has to be used to get people to watch a movie. I don't remember that being the case when I was younger, but boy, starting in the 70s and 80s and 90s and now, it is a race to the gutter in language. My children are stupid. They know how to do evil, but they know nothing about good. Television shows. When I was younger, I can remember great television programs like The Carol Burnett Show. Even Dean Martin. I can remember the variety and the comedy shows of the day. Now, once again, we have to run, we're, we're diving headfirst into the sewer. This is what we become. My children have mastered the art of evil, but they no longer know how to do good. I could go on for the next hour just giving example after example after example. You could take it into politics if you want. You could take it anywhere. We are seeing this example of a time that also St. Paul in writing to Timothy reminds him that in those, late, those last days these times will come when people are lovers of themselves more than lovers of God, and they will find their own teachers to tell them what they want to hear. And we've used that verse a number of times in just my short ministry here with this church, but it's so true that we are coming to an age, an age of narcissism like I've never seen in my life, this self-centeredness. I was looking at a posting that my granddaughter wrote on Facebook kind of lamenting the fact that she and her husband had decided to leave Florida and go back to South Carolina where she had been raised as a youngster to be closer to some family and friends uh, who would be there to help in the raising of their children. And now that they're there, the others are so busy. They really, and she kind of laments, you know, why did we bother to make this move when all the promises are not kept? And I kind of wrote there, I said, is it a case of everybody's busyness in this day we live in, or is it a case of self-centeredness? And she wrote me back a private reply, self-centeredness. Now, I can tell you my granddaughter was not raised that way, and the biggest problem she has in life, she's very trusting, very open and very giving, and an excellent mother to her three children. Yeah, I got a granddaughter that's got three kids, so I've got great grandkids. But she is an. But you have to know how they were raised and their hearts and their minds, and it, it breaks her heart when she sees this world full of evil. I mean, she was raised, hate to say it, kind of sheltered, living across the street from her grandfather and grandmother, and so we saw them often. We were a very close knit family for years. And I was privileged to perform their wedding a number of years ago, she and her husband. A little quick aside story. Sometimes young love does pay off. They knew each other in very difficult times when they were like 14. And they were 18 going on 19 when I did their wedding at the house. And they have been married now for a number of years, and I've never seen a couple so devoted to each other in everything that they do in the raising of their kids. They just knew at that tender young age, they just knew. And I watched that love, and I watched them kind of grow up together. And I finally said, you know, talking to her mother, my stepdaughter, I said, you know, Pam, 
I really think that they're ready to get married. You may think I'm crazy. And she goes, no, I have to agree. It's scary. It's scary because I'll be made a grandma probably pretty quick. I can remember her saying that. (laughs) And so a month later, very quiet private ceremony at the house with their friends. And they've been doing well ever since. And I'm very proud of them. It's nice to see occasionally some people getting it right. But when you look at our nation as a whole, the balance has tipped. I think there was a time, and I think we would agree on this, that maybe 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, we lived in a different mindset. We didn't live for evil. Even if we had evil in our our hearts, you know, you didn't parade it. You didn't celebrate it. You kind of kept it hidden. But now we've come so open that we celebrate our sin and we admonish righteousness. Let me say that again. I want that to sink in. We celebrate sin and we admonish righteousness. Our movies celebrate sin and they make the the preacher or the person of faith look like the fool whenever they get a chance. Any chance to rub it into the face of Christians is done. We are coming into a time in this world, I fully believe, that the level of persecution for those that truly belong to the faith is going to increase. I remember something I read this week from a good friend of mine. He's a missionary. And he's recently had some health issues, and he's going to have to leave the place that he has called his home, he and his wife, for the last several years, a community called Gambella in Ethiopia, which is in the middle of nowhere, as he describes it. There's no way to get there from here. You have to go somewhere else to start kind of place. And I've watched over the last seven years as they took this piece of dirt in the middle of nowhere And they have built buildings and a school and a college and you name it. They have done an incredible work out there. If you don't know, Ethiopia is going through a consistent, never-ending struggle in civil war. And for a while, I was concerned that I hadn't been seeing anything on Facebook from him at all. And suddenly, you know, he appeared because I knew he had talked about the health issues and he was going to probably have to do something new because he couldn't stay there because he'd be too far away from any kind of medical help that he might need going forward. Well, he writes that he is fine. He's uh, currently in Alexandria, Egypt, uh, with a couple of other clergy, and he's going to be doing some traveling and ending up back in the United States. But he pointed out before he goes, he'll be back in Gambella for about two weeks. And he said with the Ethiopian Civil War... They have shut down all social media, so you can't even use Facebook to put a message out. You can't use Twitter. The government has just pulled the plug, which can be done very quickly. And that's one of the things that I've always been concerned about for Christians that have become very Internet-centric. It's the first thing you can pull the plug on. You say the wrong thing, the plug can be pulled. Now, we are living, I believe, in this country on borrowed time, in our freedom of using the Internet. What is the Internet used for in the United States today, percentage-wise? Do you have, I mean, I've done some research on this. What is the most, what takes the most bandwidth of anything on the Internet in the United States today? Pornography. 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 40% of all internet traffic in the United States has something to do with pornography. That's a lot of bandwidth. 40%. It seems to survive because my people know how to do evil and they don't know about good. 40% of internet traffic has something to do with pornography. How much has to do with Christian stuff? Very little by comparison. 
Yeah, a lot of Google searches out there, a lot of news, a lot of all the things that we do in Facebook. But that disturbing figure, and it's been that way for several years, that upwards of 40 percent. I mean, that is a scary thought that we are approaching half of the bandwidth used in the United States has something to do with pornography. I think that indicts us as a people before an almighty God. These are the things that I worry about day in and day out. They kind of consume me because I, I know that I'm called to speak God's truth. And I know that I'm living in a world that I'm watching change right before my very eyes in ways that I can't imagine. I, I go back and think of how life was and what we thought the great crises were the day in the 1970s. Well, the biggest crisis of the day was Nixon's impeachment possibility and oil prices and gas lines. Now I look at today, I see this, and I'm going to try to avoid politics. I don't want to even ever be accused of taking sides because it's not my place in the ministry to, quote, take sides. My job is to preach righteousness right from wrong. But look at the level of the political discourse going on in our country today. A lot of what I'm seeing, I'm finding virtually unbelievable that all these women are coming out suddenly remembering and having this epiphany that something happened 35 years ago. It's just the, the level of this borderlines on the insane. My people have mastered. They understand evil, but they know not good. The lying, the deception that we see in everyday life that has now become acceptable even at governmental levels should have all of us in a, in a state of some kind of fear. I look at where our country has gone in the last eight years in particular. We can talk about a bad economy all day long that we ran into eight years ago. And where did it come from? I knew it was coming back in 2006, and that's why I sold a house that I had in Florida while the getting was good. And a year and a half later, it all crashed. To give you an idea and think about this, what we've seen in just the last eight years. I had a house that I purchased in 1999 for, eight, let's see, $96,000. Then I, had a, then I had an offer of 150 then the offer of 250 And I sold the house for $250,000 seven years after I bought it for a profit of 100 and some odd thousand. And I thank God for that because that's about how much debt I had for my late wife. So I had second mortgage that thing to the hill, sold out and cashed out. Then they tried to sell it for 300 and $25,000. And I'm thinking, this is a two-bedroom, two-bath house that was built in 1967 in Venice Gardens, Florida. It's like 1,100 square feet, and it has a small pool that needs to be repaired. But no, it's suddenly worth all this money. Well, I got out, but like I say, they never sold it for that kind of money. In fact, I was visiting the area in 2009. I could have purchased that house back in a short sale for $85,000. I almost did. I considered it. That's less than I paid for it before. And I sold out of it once. So we've seen this kind of economic up and down, but we kind of accept it now. So look at the other bizarre things that have happened in the last eight years, where we have gone. I think about that, that couple out in Oregon that had a nice little business, Melissa's Bakery. They're the ones that got sued because of their faith. They would not, they would not make a, a wedding cake for a same-sex marriage. They just couldn't do it. Not that they had ever denied that same person cakes before, but for something that goes against their faith, they, they had an issue and they were polite. They even went out of their way to recommend those that would help them 
in that regard to do the cake. They just couldn't do it. The state of Oregon should be embarrassed for pursuing them relentlessly and extracting without a judge or a jury a $135,000 fine. Put them out of business. That's the power of the state. No judge, no trial, no jury. Just the power of a government saying, this is what we do today. This is just the beginning of what I see happening in this country. We as Christians are quickly going to become the minority. Very quickly, if, we not, if we're not already. The real Christians are going to be the ones that are going to face persecution. Those that are enjoying their faith will be the first to leave like rats off a sinking ship when things go bad. They're not going to stay in their churches. And so I, I look at what St. Paul writes. Here's the other part of the theme. He goes, I know the time of my departure comes soon. And he talks about his ministry. He talks about the persecution. He talks about what he's gone through. He talks about what he's seeing happening in his day. And we're seeing some of the same patterns repeating themselves today. The Roman Empire, by the time of St. Paul, was beginning its decadent slide that within a couple of few hundred years just completely wiped it out in terms of being a power. But there was already beginning. The corruption was already there. The seeds of, you know, we know how to do evil. We, don't, we just don't understand good. That's why we are God's stupid children, because we don't understand right from wrong. And now we have a government and we even have church bodies that celebrate sin and condemn good. I don't get it. But I know it means the time for us is growing short. Very short. There are three things that I believe, and I'm going to quickly go through these, that we need to understand. This is going to be the takeaway point from the message today. I don't want to go too long. Number one. The world is becoming, if it already, or the world has always been hostile to the faith, but now it can do it more openly and empowered by our own government to back them up. When you have a unnamed candidate that is telling the Roman Catholic Church in particular that they need to change their ways and their thinking and their theology to be more in line with today's mental thought process, that to me is scary. When Christians that are, shall we say, fundamental in their faith, Bible believers, they're openly ridiculed by political parties today, that should be a concern for all of us. Even if I don't agree with somebody's interpretation of things of faith, it's not the business of the government to be the arbitrator of who is right and wrong. St. Paul always says that our things between brother and brother or brother and sister or whatever should be handled by the church and not by the state to begin with, but we seem to defer to them for too much, for too much. I'm at a point in life that I'm at a crossroad, and I like being at this crossroad. For a number of years... My ability to speak, preach, teach, pastor has been limited. It's called life, the things you have to do. But the doors have changed. There are are new doors that have opened. And and I realize that I'm going to spend the last years of my productive life doing more of God's work and proclaiming the message you're hearing me say today. I want to be able to use the talents that God has given me to train others to also teach, preach, and share that gospel. Because I understand that the day is going to come that the church as we understand it today, as we see it today, is going to go through a shift. You're either going to be a big church on board with the humanistic norm or you're going to be the persecuted minority. You know, God has always had a remnant church. Always. Even, look at Israel. There are always some faithful in Israel, 
But they would, as a large body, depart. I mean, how fast? You had, had Brother Moses up there getting the Ten Commandments. He's only gone for how many days? And they are building an idol to worship? The majority, not, not the minority, the majority. So it goes to show how fickle we can be in our faith. We are living in a very different time. And I don't think that any one of us 20, 30 years ago, my grandparents would have never envisioned, they've been gone from this earth for over 20 years. I don't think they would have ever envisioned a world like we have today even being possible or plausible. My parents are gone. And my father passed away 2002. And for him, the events of 9-11 were something that just blew him away. Today, we've forgotten about it, and we've moved on. What a world we live in. Our attention spans short. We just hit the news cycle for 24 hours, and we just are fed and fed all this information, and we try to live our life day by day. Yeah, the time of our departure... As St. Paul says in his, his lesson to Timothy, is, is, it, is coming soon. And he kind of talks about those that, you know, when things got rough for St. Paul, they kind of, you know, fed, faded away into the background. I call that, you know, the tenebrae of, of St. Paul. If anybody is familiar, on, we do a service quite often on Good Friday called the Tenebrae Service when Jesus is being crucified and as evening is coming one by one by one the apostles slipped into the shadows the Tenebrae Service is about those that even with all they had seen even with all that they had witnessed with their own eyes they fell into the darkness and to the fear and they hid in the shadows It took, they lived in fear for three days. They hid in an upper room, not knowing the room that they had had. They didn't know what to do. They didn't expect this. Then Jesus appeared in their midst and said, peace be with you. We are the church that has to make the decision. Are we going to disappear into the shadows? Or are we going to be that last vested standing holding that little light? How many remember that Sunday school hymn, This Little Light of Mine, I'm going to Let It Shine? My, light, my little light may not be bright enough to light up a room. And yours may only be bright enough to light up the little corner where you're at. But as we stand together, each holding our little light, then we can give light in the darkness. We can begin to show the truth. And sharing that truth may cost us our friends. Sharing that truth may cost us job opportunities. Sharing that truth may make us the brunt of jokes and ridicule. But I'd rather be known as the one that understands good and is not the one that has mastered evil. And that's what I'm asking this church and all those that are hearing this message today to decide where do you stand in all of this? Are you going to work to get along with the world or are you going to proclaim to the world the glory of the name of Jesus? You know, the funny thing is the world may be laughing today The world may be mocking us today. The world may have its way today. The world may shut down a bakery in Oregon today. The world may shut down hundreds of more bakeries and businesses for the same reason tomorrow. But the day will come. And this, remember I've read the back of the book, we win. The day is going to come when the Bible has proclaimed 
that at the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven and on earth will bow. There's even a hymn to that effect. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess him, king of glory now. I will serve my Lord. I don't care how humble of a ministry it has to be. I'm not going to be looking for the accolades of men. I'm not going to try to be one of these prosperity preachers. Yeah, give me a 10-year head start. I probably could do something like that, but I couldn't live with myself if I did. We have too many of these cathedrals of people that are out there living the multi-million dollar life. And I'm thinking of some that I that I'm not going to name names, you know, like this one guy, great speaker, sounds all good, has that 95% truth, but that 5% leaven that destroys it. He lives in his 36,000 square foot parsonage and has his own jet. I don't want to be among that group. Really, I don't. I want to be the one that is found faithful. And I hope that you want to be found faithful as well. Heavenly Father, we know we are living in a very changing world. And sometimes, yes, in the flesh, it is scary. It is worrisome. It is troublesome. No matter what part of the world you live in, whether it's in the Western Hemisphere, the United States, Canada, Europe right now is seeing unrest. Everywhere there's the beginning of unrest, this season of change. And Lord, I would pray that by your Holy Spirit, you will guide us and take us through all of these challenges that we see. Give us the courage and the conviction of your Holy Spirit to stand stand steadfast in this changing world and to be counted among the faithful. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I know we covered a lot of ground on today's program, and I hope today's message and all that was said means something to you. Learn that you're being deceived by this world, and the only hope we truly have is found in Jesus Christ, the rock of our salvation. I can't emphasize that anymore. You need to get right with your Lord Jesus Christ can't say it any louder. You need to have that relationship with Jesus Christ, that your life is built on that solid rock, not the sinking sand of governments and societies and political parties. If you believe in the mission and ministry of this program, first visit our website, truth2ponder.com. And by the way, you can support us from that website. We are trying to expand our reach on international shortwave and any other means possible. And your help at this time as we come into this important period is essential. If you believe in our ministry, would you consider helping us financially? You can make a check payable to Ancient Word Radio. That's Ancient Word Radio. Our mailing address is Post Office Box 510 510 P.O. Box 510. The city is Chilhowee, Chilhowee, Virginia. Chilhowee is spelled C-H-I-L-H-O-W-I-E, Chilhowee, Virginia. And the zip code in Chilhowee, Virginia is 24319. That's 24319. And until next week when we gather again, May God richly bless you is my prayer. This has been Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. To find out more, visit our website, truth, the number two, and the word ponder.com. That's truth, the number two, ponder.com. Truth to Ponder, shining the light of truth in a darkening world.